In this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. So said Benjamin Franklin in the 1700s, but some would argue that taxes are in fact worse than death. I mean, once you're dead, you're dead, but you've got to pay taxes for the rest of your life. Like it or not, but we all have to pay taxes in some form or other. If you live and work in a country, you are obliged to pay tax. It's compulsory to pay tax. Well, maybe if you've got a good accountant, you can pay less tax, but there's no way you're going to get out of it completely. So, why do we need to pay taxes in the first place? Well, most people would say something like this based on their household budget. The government needs to collect taxes from the private sector comprised of firms and individuals or households and they use this money they collect in taxes to provide goods and services. Things like schools, hospitals, roads, parks and gardens, police, social services and many other things as well. And these goods and services are for the benefit of the private sector. This model of government relies on having money first before it can spend and taxes for these governments go a long way to providing this money. Pretty simple, really. Well, not quite. You see, there are basically two forms of government. Governments that can produce their own money and governments that cannot produce their own money. Let's take a look at Australia, a country that has both of these forms of government. Australia has a federal or central government with six state governments and two territory administrations. There are also many local municipal or shire councils in each of the states which are in effect mini-governments. Now the state, territory and municipal governments cannot produce their own money, but the federal or central government can. Countries like Australia can do this, as too can many countries. USA, Canada, UK, Switzerland, Brazil, Japan, Russia, China and lots of others. They can create their own sovereign currency not only in the forms of notes and coins, but also just by using keystrokes on a computer with transfers between banks. In fact, most money transactions these days take place without using notes and coins. Most of it is done with bank transfers and credit cards. A government that can create its own currency is able to do this through its central bank. For example, the Reserve Bank in Australia or the Federal Reserve in the United States of America. You'll note I did not include the countries of the Eurozone among those that produce their own currencies. This is because they do not have their own individual currency producing central banks. These countries all use the Euro, which is produced by one European central bank. Central governments that can create or make money have a very special advantage over other governments. Governments that are able to produce their own currency through their central banks do not have to first collect money from taxes in order to spend. In this model of government, the government will create the money to buy goods and services from the private sector and pay without having to collect money first for government services like defence as well as for state and regional programs like social services, education, health and infrastructure or for the benefit of the private sector. It is only later that the government will collect taxes. But if this government, unlike the other model, can spend without having first to collect taxes why does it have to collect taxes in the first place, at all? For these governments, taxation serves two very important functions. Taxes give value to money, and taxes help control inflation and maintain price stability. Let's look at these in turn. Taxes give value to money. To understand this, we need to take a bit of a history lesson, back to the days when money was backed by gold. What that meant was that countries linked the value of their currency to gold. If at a particular time gold was worth $40 an ounce, then the holder of $40 of money could theoretically exchange their money from the banking system for an ounce of gold. This meant that a country's currency could not exceed the value of its access to gold stores. Then, in 1971, US President Richard Nixon took the USA off the gold standard completely and the rest of the world followed. Gold-backed currency was replaced by what is known as fiat currency. Fiat is Latin for it shall be, and fiat currency, or money, is not backed by any physical commodity like gold or silver. So what then gives it its value? In essence, fiat money derives its value from taxation. For fiat money to have value as a sovereign currency of a nation, it must be the only currency with which people and businesses can pay the taxes they are obliged to pay to the government. 
This is an extremely important point. Looking at Australia, for example, given that people and businesses have to pay taxes and given that the Australian dollar is the only currency they can pay their taxes with in Australia, it follows that people and businesses as a matter of necessity have to acquire Australian dollars. So taxes give value to money in the following way. Governments make taxes compulsory, we have to pay them by law. Governments make it compulsory that the only way you can pay your taxes is with the official sovereign currency or money that the central bank creates. Therefore, we must acquire this money somehow in order to pay our taxes and not fall foul of the law. And it follows then that taxes give value to sovereign currency. The other important role that taxes play in countries with their own central bank that can produce their own currency is that taxes help control inflation and maintain price stability. So how does this work? Well imagine a case where there's a shortage of cars, where people have plenty of money to spend but there are no cars about to buy. This is a case where demand is greater than supply. One day a person though decides to sell his car and advertises it. The market value of the car in a normal time would be something like uh, ooh, $800. But this is a time when there are a lot more buyers than sellers. Shortly after the car is advertised, there are six potential buyers at the seller's house wanting to buy the car, each with more than $10,000 in his pocket. The first buyer offers $1,200 for the car, the second buyer $1,500, the third $2,000, then the first buyer ups his offer to 2200 and before long all the potential buyers are bidding for the car at a price well beyond its true value. And the amount of money the buyers are willing to offer for the car has inflated the price. This is an example of price inflation. Imagine that there is another man who is walking by the house with a very big stick and he sees the six men waving money in the seller's face trying to get him to sell the car to them. And the man with the very big stick decides he'll rob the six men and tells them he'll hit them over the head with his very big stick if they don't give him their money. He does have a little bit of sympathy for them though and he leaves each of them with $1,000. And when he goes, one of the potential buyers offers $900 for the car and the seller accepts. Now the $900 is much closer to the true value of the car. Now, in relieving the car bidders of most of their money, the man with the stick has prevented the price of the car being grossly inflated and restored price stability. This is in effect what the central government does by imposing taxes. Sovereign government taxes take or drain money out of the economy to maintain price stability and prevent excess inflation. This is particularly useful when there is a greater demand than supply. If in another example there are more cars for sale than there were people with enough money to buy them, the sellers of the car would be more inclined to offer the cars at a reduced price so that people with a lot less money could afford to buy them. This is the reverse case where supply is greater than demand. On a government level, when supply is greater than demand, or when people choose to save their money rather than spend it, the government might consider necessary to increase spending in the private sector. And one of the ways they can do this is by lowering tax so that people and companies in society have more money to spend. In conclusion then, taxes in a country that can produce its own sovereign currency give value to the country's currency and they help control inflation and maintain price stability. It must be stressed though that this applies only to governments in countries that can produce their own sovereign currency.